Warning, the following content may contain elements that are not suitable for some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, kitties. This is your ghouly, John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. And you're listening to Slasher Radio. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Slasher Radio. It's your boy Bones, and I got Bobby Spitz here. Mink, what are you doing over there? I'm in the kitchen, Mink. Are you making pancakes? Making pancakes. Ah, oh, what's going on, everybody? You are tuning in to yet Slasher. another bonus episode. This is the two-year Slasher Radio anniversary. You got it damn right, boy. Mink, two years? Two years have been doing this. It don't even feel like two years. Right? Man. Especially now, because, like, we, it, it's been a lot lately. When the fuck has it been two years? Dude, what, what happened to it? Has it really been two years? Two years. October 1st, baby. Damn, man. Isn't that crazy? There's no fucking way. Yeah. I, I was sitting... There, dude, we were talking about it. it. I forgot about the anniversary coming up. You did, too. Like, like what the fuck? I know, but it doesn't feel real. Like, two years, man. Two years. It don't feel like no two years. Well, well it is, boy. I feel like a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming in and checking us out, guys. It is October 1st, 2019. Two years ago today, the first episode of Slasher Radio Slasher dropped. Radio. 2017, October 1st. Y'all didn't know what to do it yourselves. No. Man, and they, they had no idea what it was, was going to turn into. Shit, we had no idea. Had no idea. I mean, geez, you know, we're going to have Tom Matthews in a little bit. Hang tight. You know, I figured... I that, mean, that... That's a really nice celebration to have Mr. Thom Matthews with us for the one-year anniversary special. I mean, talk about a staple. Yeah, that is nice because you know what? When uh, <clears throat> when we were getting into but way, we were talking like way before the podcast and shit, when we started getting into our fucking Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street screen, that's what it was about. And now... I mean, like, two years, who the fuck, I mean, who would have thought in general mm-hmm. would be talking to, you know, anything, to, anybody to do with Yeah, Jason Bohees. Right, and and not only that, like, Jason hasn't, like, the Friday the 13th franchise, it was known for, you know, like, char- <laughs> characters aren't going to last long unless your your last name is Voorhees. You know, like, they haven't had a... Um, any real reoccurring characters, and I mean, I know in the original they had um, Adrian King, and she, you know, was in the first, and then she made her quick little thing in the second. But you know, it was it was quick, it was over. But now you have, even though Tom Matthews was only in the one movie, this is still a reoccurring character as in Tommy Jarvis now. Yeah, it's a, it's it's cool, man, and you know what? Two years. Fucking having somebody on to sit down and do an interview, talk about some horror. That's the way we would have do it. Yeah, yeah, did damn right, man. Two fucking years went by quick. So two years went by that fast. Another two years before you know, it, slash radio will be on the radio, on the podcast, do a shit. Four years. I don't think they're fucking ready for it. I don't think because all the giveaways within two years, if you were to tally them up, all the shit that we did, mm. all the fucking episodes. Another fucking two years of that. I don't think they're ready. No, I don't. I don't think so either, dude. And this, dude, that's another thing, man. Like being able to. to I mean, look. We, everybody knows, especially the people who've won. They are giveaways. Like we're we don't. There's no paying shipping. There's like really, you do nothing but listen to the show and and you win stuff like that. That's cool for us to be able to 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 give stuff back to you guys because we're we're nothing without listeners literally like any type of platform viewers listeners whatever like we're nothing without you guys and it is a really cool feeling to be able to 
extend some shit out. Like, dude, last Christmas we gave out uh, the the gizmo toy. Like, like that's all we grew up on. Gremlins. They got a they got a Mogwai. We could have kept that fucking Mogwai. I wanted to keep that fucking Mogwai, <laughs> but we gave it away. Did the right thing. There, there was a couple of things I was looking at, like mm, that would be nice. But we would be cool. But you know what? We fucking gave it to you guys. And all you gotta do is tune in. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I I really do feel because let, let let's just be honest. Our content is uh an, an acquired taste. Now, I, I don't want to say our content's an acquired taste, but you have to have a certain type of of attitude, thick skin to you. You know, you gotta really you gotta be a real one to really take it in, and enjoy it, and listen to it. So. You said take it in. Oh, fuck, I did. Damn it. Take it. Uncle Ray Ray's got a game. I did say take it in, but that's what they got to do. They got to take it in more ways than one, maybe. Got to take it in. They ain't got no choice. They ain't got no choice. But it's like, you know, we get to... I think our audience, and over the years, we've had a lot of people that interact with us on Twitter. You know, they come, they go. A lot of them have stayed. And I think right now, with the IR Chris's and the, the Ambers and... And all that, that that this is that we have the perfect demographic, at, or or audience, you know, like it it re, the relationship we've been able to build, and with the type of people, you know, like it's because we've had a couple of people who've interacted a lot, and nobody that <clears throat> that I still hear from now anyway on Twitter, you know, a couple of them not to be mean, they were a little eye rolly. It's like, uh, God, uh, okay. But, you know, now I think we've really chiseled down to our core base. And, dude, we have the best listeners in the world, I think. Yeah. They they rival the wrestling yeah. fans. Yeah. Yeah. So, hell, so, a lot of them are wrestling fans. I don't know how the hell that happened. They crossed over, mate. They know. They got their senses up. Yeah, damn right. They, they, know, they know what's real. And, and we, we just appreciate it, man. It's awesome that we've been able to... And the shit we've been able to do... Like, we just talked to Bill Mosley a few weeks ago. Like, uh. Yeah, but I mean, that's another thing. Talk about who'd have thought. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. Who the hell would have thought that? And and to us, like, it, you got you guys got to realize, it's hard. Because, especially, like, we got Thom Matthews coming on earlier, like, uh, later. We're fans of these people. Like we are huge fans of of them, and it's like, ah, yeah. oh, man. We're, how do you be professional? I don't. Know. It's hard because you sit there and it, people just like you. But at the same time, when you rewind it, it's like seeing Batman or some shit. Like yeah, in real life. So then, boom, there they are. They're there, and that's why we try to do our best because we know that the listeners. You know, we try to experience that for everybody and, and, and help you guys live through, you know, that experience through us and and share it. And it's it's not just me and Bones sitting down or whoever, you know, talking to these guys. It's all of us sitting down and talking to these guys. Even Bones, I mean, you'll send a tweet. Any questions? Yeah. Anything that you guys want us to ask or. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Damn near every episode. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. dude. And. I mean, <clears throat> we had uh, we had phone lines for a while. I would like to try and um, find a better way to kind of streamline that into it and get it back in again. You know, we we really do, and I I we have to be the most interactive ho- horror podcast at least, without question, dude. Like, who else is doing? I, I've heard of after we started taking phone calls. I just want to point out, so I did notice, yes, yeah. yeah, some people. Some other shows had started tweeting, oh, call in, leave a voicemail, we'll play. Like, no, dude, yeah, that would be cool and all, but we want to talk to you. Yeah, we fuck around, we might call you. <laughs> <laughs> you, might, you might get a text, uh, why you, what is it, WYD text from Bobby Spitzer at like 2 in the morning. You up? <laughs> What's going on over there? <laughs> But, you know, that that's another thing, too, man. There was a few times where I felt a couple other shows kind of stepped on our toes a little bit as far as, you know, because they follow, I, I've seen they follow us on Twitter, and it's like, you see what we're doing. So I, I've noticed quite a few times other shows have kind of jumped. That, that was the whole Shudder thing, too. It's like, 
another show started and it's like dude we were the first horror podcast to fuck with shutter like that sponsorship from shutter free promo code get 30 free days we were the first horror podcast to do that and you know months later other i'm like i was like man you know what some bullshit god damn it shane <laughs> it is and you know i i i didn't really the the shutter thing i i talked about a little bit but you know i don't want to we never mention these other shows because it's like we're not going to give them any shine for it. But we we do do it to be the best too. We really do because we want to bring you guys the best. But those other shows, I've seen a lot of them come and a lot of them go. We're still here. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah. We every week too. Like a lot of it, bi-weekly, once a month, all that. We're, we're here every week. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> whether you agree or not. It's there for, you know, it's there. Two years, man, went by so quick. I mean, are we going to be doing this 10 years from now? I hope so. I Put hope in so. Big 10. Big yeah. 10. And you know what? If we did, well, first of all, hopefully our pockets will be a little bigger by then. But you know, that, that's besides the point. But if we did, I can guarantee you this. We will have the same passion for this shit. Oh yeah, because before that's what started the whole thing. Right, it was way there was a podcast. Oh, shit, dude, I wish we could have had the content. Oh yeah, for the podcast because there was a podcast before the podcast. It just the shit wasn't recorded. Yeah, yeah, that's true, dude. And you we know? always talked about like we, dude. When we, you know, it always pissed me off. Remember all the times when we had our little basement spot and our like we pretty much slept in the same room. Yeah, we did. You know, it was like, yeah. it, what do they call it? It's not a. It wouldn't have been a studio setup, would it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, is. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, dude, a couple of times I recorded like on my phone. I would just hit record and record through the night, and I would hope because we, dude, how many times have we been in tears, crying, laughing? Oh my god, couldn't breathe. To the fucking sun came up, man. L- l- yeah, literally. Yeah, and and I was never able to catch any of that, man. It would be some stupid shit too. Like we'd both be laying there, just fucking about ready to go, you know, call it a night. And the fucking cat would go, all right, that would be it. <laughs> fucking done. That's it. Up for the rest of the night. Yeah, yeah. And the few t- after a few times, to- well, after a lot of times, I said, you know what? I gotta re- try and record some of this. And any time I remembered to try and do it, it. It was, yeah. damn it, man, if we could have found it was, those. We are so caught up in the moment. There's a few videos that you got, though. Yeah, there's a few of them. That we got to do something with those. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and those were, like, way, like, pre. Those were the boys. Those teenagers, almost, yeah. Those were the boys, <laughs> man. You still, you got some good ones up there still. But, but it, you know, I think it's maybe just because it's us and we're we're looking at it as, like, th- those are nothing. <laughs> those, I mean, they're really good, but compared. I know, man. It's so fucked up. <laughs> it's so fucked up. We should have just invested in, like, a... A cameraman. Nikon or something, yeah. We should have just had someone follow us around all the time. We could have put an ad out on Craigslist and paid him fucking... Twenty dollars a week or something, and let's be honest, we would have paid him in weed, and he would have been very satisfied. Oh, he would have been very happy. Yeah, exactly. Thinking back, we probably could have got Coral to do it. (laughs) That's true, man. (laughs) We probably could have. Oh yeah, bro, got you. Like all you gotta do is just record everything, everything, and you know he's meticulous, so he would have recorded. Oh, oh yeah, everything. Like, he would have got us, like, perfect lighting, <laughs> like, just for no reason. <laughs> he would have started taking it too serious. Yeah, that that is Coral, too. When, uh, when, when Fetha was moving, <laughs> it was me, Stevie, Coral, and a couple other guys, and that dude, Eddie, and we were helping Fetha move. And we were waiting for Coral at the garage, and, <laughs> dude, Stevie was pissed. He was like, oh, he better not start his shit. Fucking thinks he knows everything. He's going to act like he's the boss. He ain't no fucking <laughs> boss. This, this, that. <laughs> well, I mean, he used to move for a living. Exactly. And that's why Stevie was getting out, just because he did it. 
don't mean you know shit. You don't know shit the whole, the whole thing. You know, Ed Coral ended up going there and doing that. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, missed opportunities, man. Missed opportunities. Yeah, always did. You always did always say, man, I wish we could fucking get this. Like, like even way before the podcast, you had that, like, Twitter for the uh, Tosh.0 show. Oh, God. You know, always had an eye out waiting for the fucking the right moment. And there were so many moments. But, you know, back then, like, going viral and shit like that, yeah. we didn't quite understand it wasn't how that even worked. Really a... It was just becoming a thing. Yeah, it was. And, and at that point, it was really just based off of, like, just... Uh, I mean, it still is chance, but... It, we, we weren't... We would have had to have that camera on 24-7. Remember too, these kids are like when you go viral, it's something. Then I don't want to say when you go viral, but these YouTubers, they script it, they act it, they edit it. Th- that's not what we did. It was on the spot, happened, never gonna happen. Yeah, again. <laughs> never gonna watch that. It happened. That was it. It was gone. Yeah, and it was perfect when it did out. Like if we could have caught Stevie when he first realized the meow. Yeah. Oh God. Oh, but but, but we could have never reenacted that. Ever. We can never do that ever again. Yeah. We can never do that again. But you know what, man? Now we got the podcast. We could talk about it. We could share it with people. And I think they're relating because it's not that they're, you know, they, they everybody's got their own stories and shit like that. And, you know, it's it's something to where they tune in. The extra content. It's not just the horror stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's the extra content and everything, you know. And that's what we're saying. Like back then, we were doing all this shit and we'd be watching Friday the 13th while all this shit was happening. Pretty much, yeah. So, like, that kind of provided a soundtrack, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely commentary, <laughs> for for sure. But, yeah, man, that it, and you're right. You're, and we, we are still, it's harder to do it, you know, we're across the country from each other, but, <clears throat> like, the hose, we, thank God we got that recorded. We got the hose, yeah. The piss on, piss it's, on still the it's still happening. Yeah, Stevie farting that time. Yeah, God, dude. There's, there, I just, there was so many moments, just like little shit, like the nipple. Oh God, that it, our uncle had a, a wife beater. That his nipple, the same. What was it? it was the left nipple, right? It's the left nipple. The left nipple kept coming out for some reason, to even the point where he found it funny. No matter what he did. That nipple would not stay in his shirt when he wore a tank top. It just, that's just what it was. If, if to us, it was, it was like, that, that's something like we had to have had on camera. Like, because if we would have been recording early and that would have caught on. Oh, yeah. Then people would kind of understand it better. Yeah, yeah. The Gabba deal. How <laughs> stupid is that? The Gabba deal. Oh, that pissed him off. That, not only did that piss him off, but we, we were sitting there, two idiots blasted out of our faces on a couch <laughs> hysterical la- hitting each other we're laughing so hard crying almost pissing our pants over the word gabba deal gabba deal <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is, sounds so dumb but oh man wow it was so fucking hilarious nobody understood us though no I mean, could you imagine? Because we were sitting. Also, we were in my parents' house at the time. <laughs> my dad had a camera in the living room, and yeah. he didn't like us really going there when he wasn't there anyway. Right. So you know he was watching because he knows the alarm went. Off. We we got in. Or the alarm went off. He's watching. He got an alert. The alarm was turned off. In fact, if I remember correctly, he probably had to turn it off for us. Either way, he knew. So now he's watching, and he can't hear anything. <laughs> he's, but he's, he's probably wondering why the fuck we're so hysterical. He, he, I bet a small part of him, as mad as he was, he was like, "I wish I was that guy. What guy? I gotta know what the fuck is so funny." <laughs> what What is so funny right now? Because like there was not a breath to be taken. No. And then you got Stevie stomping around mad, so he knows it's something that pissed him off. <laughs> yeah. He's, <pissed. laughs> he's like, "What they oh, do?" Man. That shit was funny as hell. Yeah. And, and the camera was literally like... It, it was like our television show on his phone at the time. 
Imagine that. Right, there. right smack dab in the middle. Dude. Oh, man. I wish there was access to that shit, dude. Right. Right. Uh, but, yeah, man. I mean, it's been a ride, though. It's been a fucking ride. Got the deal. Still going. Got the deal. Yeah. Two years strong. We've had uh, a lot of ins and outs, ups and downs, and a lot more up than down, I think. Yeah, this shit has been one big fucking boss ass ride. Yeah. Yeah. The f- and the hard work that goes into it that these people have no idea about. No, they don't know. They have no idea. I don't want them to know. No, exactly. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, no. I don't want them to know. They shouldn't know. One, they, they got nice, easy, everything nice. Until they ask, it's on the show, and then we got to put up the ringer. Yeah, yeah. That's been fun, too. That's another thing. A lot of, We have balls. We put random-ass people on. that we. A lot of this show is... It, it, we have to have chemistry to, to be able to... You know, and, and I think you people can sense it, because a lot of other... I don't want to say a lot of, but other shit, if the chemistry isn't there, you can tell it sounds off. It sounds awkward, yeah, it's, weird. It's like an awkward like, little, you know, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you and I, especially, it's not fair, because we've known each other so, like, our whole lives, like, it, it's, we're on such a wavelength that it's easy. Yeah. You know, like, I can, I can tell when you want to talk, you can tell when I want to talk. You know, we, we know each other's, we know how to work around each other perfectly. You know, so that that's what that's that's what podcasting is. That's what makes a good podcast. Any of them, and we brought a random stranger that we've never spoken to before. <laughs> but you know, there's a there's an initiation process. I don't think these people know about. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely levels, without question. There's levels to it. Yeah, and not for anything. We've ne- we've never had. Well, thank God. Knock on wood. We've never really had a bad guest. No, we really haven't. You know, like uh, some are more like Rob is so articulate and 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 Michelangelo with it, and Greg is just balls out, throw facts at like they all really Pope is all over the place, and and it, it but it was nice. It works. Yeah. See, that's the thing. You ever see that movie uh, in the army now? No. It's got Bill Murray in it. And it's basically, he rounds up a bunch of fucking misfits and creates, like, the best platoon huh. in the army. Or, no, it's not in the army now. I forgot what things called called. Stri- in the army now is with Polly Shore. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing called Stripes. Something like that with Bill Murray. But basically, the thesis is he just gets a bunch of fucking misfits, and that's what we do. Make something out of them. Angels in the outfield. That's right. I hope it's called Stripes. Because I don't know what the fuck that movie was called. Sure as hell was it Ghostbusters. <laughs> no, it damn sure wasn't Ghostbusters. Speaking of Polly Shore, we got fucking stiffed on by him. Dude, I've... I never tried again. But it was just such a... Like, there has been quite a few interviews where, you know, we gotta go out of our way to... This was, it felt like such an underhand toss. Yeah. You know, it was like, but damn. Holy sure. Now he's got his own thing called Random Rants. Son of a bitch. And you know what? I'll tell you something. We got turned down recently by John Carpenter. See, that is more understandable. I get that. I get that, man. Holy sure. But you know what the bitch about it is? We could go on Cameo and pay him to shout us out. I ain't paying him shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, but no. No. John Carpenter ain't on Cameo. Snoop Dogg is. How, I wonder how much Snoop Dogg That's got to be a lot of money. It, it is, but there's other people in there that's really cool. And um, I seen Snoop Dogg. I was like, that. But you know, that's the thing. Like, We're not going to pay anybody to do that. No, no, not no. because we think we're better than that, but just because at that at that point, that's just like, how do I put it? It's um, it's something that definitely, I don't know, man. It's just not. It's not all. It's not authentic. Yeah, it's not the same. No, it's not. That that's empty. I would pay Katie Featherson. 
Oh my god. <laughs> I wonder if she's on camera. Wouldn't that be a bitch? She would be so fucking mad. She would. She'd be pissed. That's what I'm saying. She would be. She would. Like, I got. Oh my god. I gotta do it. Hold on. Hold on. Dude, if she, Katie, if you are listening again, you can make a cameo right now for fifty thousand dollars, and I know at least one person that will buy it. I take out a loan. <laughs> you gotta do it now. <laughs> Dude, that would kill her a little bit inside. Oh my god. God, I got a fucking smile wave. Yeah, she's she does not have a cameo. Damn it. Dude, that would have been funny. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Damn it. Oh my god. I'm gonna check often if she's ever on it. Oh shit. Because she is I'm fucking buying it. Yeah. 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 And we'll play it every fucking show. <laughs> Poor Katie. Leave her alone. <laughs> we gotta leave her alone. It would be funny, though. It would be hilarious. Every show. She said she would do the show if we were nice and nice. Mink, now this is up to you, because this is your hill that you're standing on. You know what I mean? Like Every Paranormal Activity episode, it's like you have to. So I'm not gonna say you shouldn't, but would you right. do a Paranormal Activity episode and be completely nicey nice yes of course Would that's you? the thing like she she doesn't understand like it became a shtick like that's all it was it, oh of course yeah yeah you know like of course we could yeah for sure but that's your shtick though <laughs> you know what i mean it's like how you oh, I know, but then i mean like you know for for what is you know the situation is, you know of course yeah man maybe we will and we have well, we haven't done a paranormal activity episode. Oh, based on like at the you know, show, like, the movie, yeah. I, I mean, shit, dude. All right. Maybe paranormal th- activity three coming soon. I did like that movie too. It was good. Mm-hmm. But I would like to see her in another movie besides paranormal activity soon. All right. You know what this sounds like? Challenge accepted, Katie. Challenge accepted. How you like that? All's in her court. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, let's put the pressure on Katie Featherson. All's in her court. Well, yeah, man. I mean, uh, bada boom, bada bing. Uh, here, here's Tom Matthews, guys. We've been rambling. Here's Tom Matthews. Return of the Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead Two. Never hike alone. Friday the Thirteenth, the game, and Friday the Thirteenth. Part 6, Jason Lives, Tommy Jarvis. Enjoy, guys. Tommy Jarvis. Thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. And as promised, we have a very, very, very special guest. We are joined by the iconic Tom Matthews. Mr. Matthews, how are you doing tonight, sir? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. Oh, Hello, thank everybody. You. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. We were just telling you all that before we hopped on. But everybody, all of our listeners, we announced it a few weeks ago. Everybody's excited to hear what you say. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, hope they're not too excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think the first question I kind of wanted to ask you was, uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about uh, your start in acting? Like, what made you want to get into acting? Sure. I, uh, I, I know it well. I was uh, out of high school a couple of years, just kind of floundering, didn't really have a passion for any one particular thing. I, I did, I was lucky enough, though, my grandfather and my father, they're all in construction, so I kind of, I knew how to do all that stuff. And I was uh, experimenting with painting and painting on canvas, and so mm-hmm. doing the colors, so I was always a, a very artistic uh, uh, person, I guess. I knew about construction. I didn't know how much I knew until, um, 
I just, you know, I always thought that everyone knew what I knew, so it had no value to it. Right. To be honest with you. You know, if I knew it, everyone else must have known it, so it had no value. And only later in life, um, I found that it, it had some value to a lot of people. That being said, um, so I was just kind of floundering, working at a, a hair salon, just help, not cutting hair, but just helping out, making uh, the, the person make shampoo and stuff. And, and I was dating uh, this girl, and, and she, she she suggested, uh, just out of the blue, she goes, why don't you become an actor? And that was it. Hmm. That's all she had to say. Then I started studying. That one thing, just so that's what I'll do with my life. I'll start studying acting. So I started studying. Uh, I went over to um, study for three three years, I guess, and then I went over to Lorimar Productions with the sole intention of getting my SAG card. Okay. I figured if I was working over at Lorimar Productions, and at the time they were doing Balance and Not Landing and Falcon Crest and a bunch of Flamingo Road was another show of theirs. I think I'm dating myself. But um, so uh, I was there working for maybe a year and a half. And then, you know, everyone knows what you, your passions are and what you want to do. And my job was to fill up the kitchens, restock the kitchens. And there's like three of them in the, on the third floor at the Lorimar building. And there's a bunch of them down on the, down on the lot. Dallas had their own kitchen on, and their own production uh, offices and not landing the Falcon Crest. All the writers were up and the executives were up and up on the third floor where I was working. So I'd, I'd move around a lot. I'd see everybody. So long story short, uh, I ended up getting a walk-on on Falcon Crest, Dor Saba, Taft Hartley and me, Taft Hartley and me and gave me uh, a walk-on and that's how I got my SAG card. The day I went to go get my SAG card, I see this guy pulling out of Lorimar. Now, that's over in Culver City. And I went to the SAG office, which at the time was on Sunset, to go uh, get my SAG card to put down, put down the money that was required. So I see this guy leaving. And the next time I see him, I see him hitting me at the SAG office. <laughs> and it's like a 45-minute drive. So I see, the, I see him leaving the parking lot at the same time I do. I don't know what he was, but he was going to SAG and he ended up running into me. <laughs> So uh, that's how I got my. That's how I got started from a, a girlfriend suggesting it, and then uh, working at Laura Martin. That's how I got my SAG card. And then I went on to do a bunch of commercials and stuff, and uh, then I started slowly doing films. Uh, my first, my first on camera thing was on uh, The Woman in Red. I had a little bit in that, a little cameo. And then my next big thing was uh, was Return of the Living Dead, the big part. Then I got Return of the Living Dead. So is it true that it took you nine months to get that part? It took me. It took. It's true. It's 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 true. It was. Uh, what had happened was I went in and read for. Um, well, actually, they put me on tape, and I did the reading for the casting director, Sanzi Stokes, and um, she said I did a great job. I said great, that's great. So I was really excited, and didn't I didn't hear anything for nine months. So. You know, a week after that, you're like, no, I, I guess I didn't get it. The director didn't like me or something. I don't know. And then nine months later, I get a, I get a call back, and I go in, and there wasn't many people there. There weren't very many other actors there. I'm sitting around. Well, it, it comes out through the course of me talking to people that I actually, they hired me to do the, to do the role. And I was there to read for uh, the females for uh, Tina. Definitely yeah. ran off and actually got it, but there's other four or five other girls who are leading for it. So that's how I found out I got the part. Wow. Um, and it took it took nine months because they were having some legal issues with the with the the name, the rights to the name. And they got oh. that out. I guess I think it took Tom Fox that long to work it out to get the rights. He was the producer on the show. And it was uh it was a great great experience. Looking at your, um, well, I mean, just judging by your your acting, your career on IMDb, it looks like that's one of your your first real big roles in an actual in a TV. I've seen you did TV before, but you know, in a film, so I'd imagine that'd be a little intimidating. Like, <laughs> oh, nine months, I guess it's done, and then you got to hop right back into it. Right, exactly. 
did you doing doing this film, The Return of the Living Dead? Did you feel the um, I, I don't know how to explain it. Did you feel the the that that movie was going to be be something great? Because now it's looked back on as you know one of these these hierarchy films. And did did you have that feeling on set with what you guys were doing that it was going to turn into something? That- no, not not at all. We thought we were just making a you know a, a B movie and playing it for real, and you know had no idea it was gonna. I, I mean, I literally there were some funny parts in it. The situations were funny, but I had no idea. Uh, how they were piecing it all together because we—I mean, we were acting our asses off for, for oh, drama, yeah. you know. We were, we were, it's it's truly a, a dark comedy because the humor comes out of the situations that everyone's in, some great one-liners and stuff, and it just uh, it was really a pleasure. And the music, you know, really uh, kind of is crafted to help 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 that along too. So, yeah, we had no nobody had any idea. I had no idea at all. So how was Clue, it working? Clue, 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 was, Clue was, he got hired, he feels differently about it now, but at the time, because he, he told me so, he he uh, he considered this this movie below him. Wow. And uh, so he was, and he got hired at the very, at the 11th hour. I mean, we were rehearsing. He wasn't there to help. So the first day of shooting, he shows up, and he's got a lot of dialogue, and he's stressed out, and the part he probably wouldn't have taken if he didn't need the, the cash, I guess. But he's so happy that um, he did because it's, it's the, the movie's fantastic and um, just a great experience for everybody. Yeah, it looked like you guys had a lot of fun in there working together, and um, one of the things we, I noticed yeah. in a lot of your interviews is that you pointed out working with Dan – how he got, he let you guys have like a lot of leeway. So how was it working with him? You know, he did, he did. And that's really, I mean, kudos to him because that's really unusual for a writer director to let anybody change his words or, or bring anything, anything to the table or even have a discussion about it. It's, it's very rare. And, uh, I've, and I, I, and I did, I didn't know that at the time I've come to find that out as I've done other uh, other projects and stuff, particularly in TV and stuff, you can't, you don't, you have to say it exactly how they want, want it done most of the time. So, um, so the more I worked, the more I appreciated that experience uh, working with Dan and also, you know, I, I, most of my scenes were with Jimmy Karen and um, just, um, we just had a great time. He was just a man, he'll be missed. Miss him all the time. We both we, we found on we found on a part two that <clears throat> excuse me we found on a part two that we had the same birthdays, which is November twenty eighth and oh wow. So we we celebrated our birthdays every year. We always had a dinner together. If it, if it wasn't on the day of our the day we were born, it was before or just after him and Alba, and they always came over here to the house to uh, for the holidays and stuff like that. So it was nice. We, we were pretty close. Oh wow, that's real nice. Yeah, it, building relationships like that off your roles. I mean, that that's got to be us as viewers. We just see you guys in that role, and you know, it's over. It's done. The movie's off. Yeah. Well, just so you know, when when you're acting with somebody and you guys you make a connection, you swear to God you're going to see them. I mean, it feels like you're going to see them for the rest of your life, but it it never happens. It just because your life catches up with you. You know, you got to deal with your life, your kids, your your wife, your girlfriend, whatever. It just, uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. But th- this one stuck, and uh, um, it was a pleasure, pleasure to know him. It was a, it was really a, a great, he's actually my age now when he did, he did the role in oh, wow. uh, Return of Living. Yeah, so that's kind of another thing. He just, you know, he just passed on in October of last year. Um, yeah. And they used, and I don't know if you saw the Academy Awards or the Oscars. Um. In memorandum, when they did that for the actors who had passed and the producers and stuff like that, um, they used uh, the still from Return of the Living Dead, so I was standing right next to him, which was kind of cool. I did notice that. Yeah, that's awesome. That yeah. was pretty cool. Well, it it definitely looked like you guys had a lot of fun, like you were saying. Uh, but I did read somewhere, and I mean, correct me if it's wrong, but uh, you didn't like the Return, uh, Return of the Living Dead too. 
Excuse me? <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really, I, both films as, as a whole for me, you know, I, I definitely. Really? What? Part one is so much better than part two. Well, I, yeah, I was Only just the... getting to that. Yeah, it is. Part, part two, part two, we went, they went after the jokes. They went after the humor. Right. Part one did not. And it just, the humor was, it came out of the genuine and the, and the situations. And it just, I mean, that's, that's true comedy right there. You don't go for the jokes. Right. They just. It's just a bizarre. It's just a, it was a, diff, a completely different experience. Yeah, and, and as a viewer, I think we were able to to see the change too, for sure. So yeah, the the original by far is you know that that's in a class of its own. It's a class. It's a it's 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 the cult classic, not the uh, not part two or part three. Yeah, yeah. Think about part one too. It also is part of pop culture because when when I'm when I'm out and I I go I ask people what do zombies eat and they go brains and I said. Do you know why you say that? And you go, no. I said, it's because of the movie yep. I did, Return of the Living Dead. And, and they haven't even seen it. Half of them haven't even seen the movie. But they know that zombies eat brains. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, that's true. That movie you know, also gives it, you a reason why they were going for the brains and everything. So they like it, kind of made sense exactly, out of it. Exactly. And that's, you know what? That's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie when they have that conversation with that. It's a great scene. Her spine and the camera, the camera angle's low, and the spine's going back. It's king, 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 bouncing back and forth. And Don Calfa has the conversation with her. Not yeah. people, brains. <laughs> Stops the pain of dying. So creepy. So was it was it true for the second one? They really spent money, like a lot of money, on flying you out to to have you assume that that character just for the second. Return of the Living Dead. Had me fly me out. No, we shot that all here in LA. In LA? Oh, I thought I read somewhere where they spent some money or something like flying you guys out. <laughs> we oh. all shot in town. Yeah. Nice. And you're from LA, right? Yes, yeah, so I was. I was born. I, I. So, I was actually born on Hollywood Boulevard. Believe it or not. Wow. At the, Holly, at the Hollywood Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that weird. <laughs> me and my two brothers I have a brother 16 months older than I am and a brother 11 months younger than I am and we all had the same doctor and born at, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard talk about meant to be <laughs> native, I'm a native hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, when, whenever, whenever anyone uh, complains about the traffic mm -hmm. I tell them to go home <laughs> well, I mean, hey, there is tra traffic is horrible there, ain't it though? Like, oh, it's terrible! I mean, oh, Jesus, there used to be a rush. There used to be a, a, a rush hour here. Now there's a it's a rush five hours. It's like all day long. It just doesn't stop. Oh wow! Just to go, just to go three miles at seven thirty in the morning. It takes me forty five minutes. No way, man! Wow, that's no, it's crazy. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Let me ask you something like like non non uh, horror, I guess you would say, but just growing up, L.A. dude, like is like the city magic, I guess you would say. Like a lot of people growing up in Manhattan and stuff say, like the, the city has changed. New York is different from back then. Is that the same with L.A. Like the vibe and everything, just throughout the years, have you yeah, noticed that change? It has. I mean, when when actually when uh, Return of the Living Dead was made, there was a huge punk rock scene in Los Angeles, and and across the country in certain uh, big cities and stuff like that. Right. So that was, that was a real thing. And then um, uh, the, the culture changed and uh, like there's a, there's a, a street that I lived very close to called Melrose. And there's the Groundlings were on, they had a theater on there, the Groundlings. And over the years it became, it kind of uh, became like an international street. All these, Gucci was on it, and uh, uh, the Groundlings was on it. All these international sh uh, stores were on it, and then that kind of went away, and then now it's kind of seedy again. <laughs> so, uh, and now Hollywood Boulevard, they're building that up now, uh, yeah. and over on La Brea and Santa Monica, there's lots of, lots of construction, beautiful buildings over there, and malls, and all kinds of stuff. So it's it's still it's constantly constantly changing, and the traffic is just getting worse and worse. 
or somewhere saying it. And I'm from yeah. New York, so I always wonder. I always hear that LA traffic oh. is worse, but I never, I would never want to experience it either. <laughs> well, uh, well, the other thing is, I mean, you're from Manhattan. Well, no, 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 no. Okay. So the thing about LA, it's massive. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. so many suburbs, and it's spread out, and you have to have a car here. But it's because it's, it's LA so County, crazy. right? Yeah, it could. No, LA City is just huge. It just goes. For, there's, there's like, there's no field. It's just buildings and for, I mean, downtown. To go downtown, there's buildings all the way. To go past East East LA, there's buildings all the way for another, you know, forty miles. It's it's just massive. Right. It's just it just spread out, and you can see it when you land in the LAX. You can see where it starts. Yeah, and land wise, it's gigantic, ain't it? It's, it's massive, it's huge. And then uh, LA County is even bigger, and it, but you'll find fields and you'll find hills and stuff in the LA County, Malibu, and and things like that. But it's I just, always want uh, to go there and check it out. Like it just seems like a great yeah, place to be, especially in this industry that that you, you know, being an yeah. actor and you're right there in the yeah. mix. Yeah, absolutely. You got to be here or here or New York, you know. Right. Uh, uh, but if you're going to be an actor and broke, you want to be here in L.A. because the weather's so fucking great. <laughs> you get something nice out of it. <laughs> right? I, think there's, I think there's more bums in Santa Monica because they're on the beach and the weather's great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's true. If I was a bum and a home, I'd be a, I'd be in, in Santa Monica. Yeah, I'd rather be a bum on the beach than a bum in two feet of snow. That, yeah. That's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you got your start, you know, your inspiration in the acting, and you went forward. What, what, what would you say is the closest character you ever played to yourself? Probably uh, Tommy Jarvis. At wow. that time, uh, it's probably the closest I had played to myself. Nice. That makes sense, because I, at least personally, when I look at Tommy Jarvis, I think of Don Matthews and Tommy Jarvis being the same person. You know, because when we see you off the camera, it's just like, that was that's Tommy Jarvis right there. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that was the closest uh, character I, I have played to myself, I think. Because, you know, Return of the Living does a punk rocker, and then I turn into this brain-sucking um, zombie, which, which is a great... I mean, that was such a great part for an actor to play, because this young kid, naive kid, punk rocker, first day in the job, and you know, next thing I'm tearing ass down the hallway with acid in my eyes, wanting to eat my girlfriend's brain. How fucking cool is that? Uh, that's got to be a trip to play as an actor. Like you just get to let loose yeah. as a zombie. So much, so much fun. Yeah, it was so much fun. You know, I'm dying. I, I'm slowly dying. So you got to kind of figure all that out. How much? How much are you really dying on? On which page? So you got to emotionally right. and you know, it's, it's a great, yeah, it's a great, it's a great. Mine. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, it's a good segue because you mentioned Tommy Jarvis, obviously. Uh, one of your notorious roles are Friday the 13th. And uh, you guys created something new with Return of the Living Dead. Like, that was your own. You guys were fresh on that. Now you're joining a, a franchise well-established like Friday the 13th. What was it like getting into that? Well, it was it was well-established, but not in my mind, because I hadn't really uh, watched them. Okay. So uh, I, I, I auditioned. I got a call back to go in. It was like, Three or four of us to uh, read for the producers, Frank Mancuso Jr., Jr. and uh, Tom McLaughlin was there, and uh, a bunch of other people. So uh, I got the role. Great. So then I went and looked at Tommy Jarvis in 4 and 5, and uh, to see if I can pick up some kind of mannerisms or something that I should carry over into Part 6. Didn't really see anything. Nothing really stuck out. No quirks or anything like that. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so I didn't really, you know, I just uh, just stepped into it and just kind of dissected the script and see what that was, what, what that would give me, and that's that's what I ended up doing. You're right. I mean, he was a. I I don't want to I don't want to say, but in part five, I feel he was more of a uh, a duller side character, and not as far as the acting. I'm just talking. His character was more quiet, reserved. You know. And you were so much, you really gave Tommy Jarvis a personality. Yeah. Well, he didn't, look, look, John didn't, John didn't have a lot to react to. I had right. fucking Jason to react to, and he was going to, yeah. he was going to start kicking some ass. 
and killing some people. Yeah, but, but you also kind of expressed more of what was going on in Tommy's mind, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I had a lot more. And the script is, Tom, Tom McLaughlin wrote a great script, mm -hmm. and the, it was shot beautifully, and, you know, part five, if I saw a girl with big tits. I knew I was going to see him in a wet T-shirt or something <laughs> like that. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's it, honestly, it kind of scared me that I, I got the role in part six because I thought, what the hell did I get into after watching part five? It, it kind of scared me a little bit. <laughs> but I had to go back and reread the trip again because yeah, I didn't see any titties in that way. <laughs> so yeah, okay. We just, we just, we, we're, we're, we're going to, um, you know, we got something coming up as far as what we thought was checklist. I don't know if we could say this or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just between us, I guess one of the things that I feel that a horror movie should have, you know, like the cliche checklist, is titties. <laughs> a horror movie has yeah. to have titties, you know? <laughs> it's just one of those uh, cliches, right? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see him in the thing. Ah. <laughs> uh. I just saw. No, they weren't in the thing. Yeah. Carp yeah. Carpenter's classic. <laughs> yeah, we were yeah. just talking about that movie, too. Funny you bring it up. <laughs> no, yeah, we awesome. did a that one. That's one of the things I pointed out, too. There was no titties in that. <laughs> you no didn't titties. bring it up. <laughs> uh, you guys think very much alike. I'm getting nervous now. Now, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, I was going to ask you about, you know, how do you... It was, Tommy Jarvis was a character that was played previously. You know, how'd you go into approaching that? You told us, but, you know, just kudos to you to being able to, that, that's that got to be so difficult. I can't remember off the top of my head where I've seen it done before, but an actor going into a role, a new actor in the same role, and that's, whenever I think of Tommy Jarvis and most people, we think of part six, Tommy Jarvis. Yeah. Yeah, I was the, la I was the last one to do it. Also, I'm in, I'm in the game, too. They used my yeah. image in the game, which is cool. Which is really great for the franchise because we're, I mean, they're creating this all new, these, I mean, kids are playing video games at eight, nine, ten. Oh, yeah. So they're getting all these fake, even younger than that. They just hear Jason yeah. and they know the mask. I mean, I know five year olds uh, who are running around like want to be Jason for Halloween and stuff like that. But the, but the game is creating this whole new demographic for fans for the franchise and um, who, shouldn't see the movie until they're older, at least 12 or 13, I, I would guess. Right. Um, and, and, they, and they will see it because they're, they're going to be fans. I, I, we know? can attest to that because Bobby and I are huge fans of the video game, and we have played with five-year-olds on that game, unfortunately. Yeah. We've run into them, so <laughs> they are playing that game. We can attest. Um, they're they're on there, and they're, and they're good, dude. They play the game just as good as we do. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them got filthy mouths. I could tell you that much too. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's like you said, you know, like kids even younger than than what you have mentioned. They they know who Jason is because I have a six year old, and I showed him the case when I bought it because I went out got a physical copy, and you know, he seen it. He said without me even pointing it out, he knew who Jason was. Are you? You've got the hard case. Yeah, I got the actual physical copy. Oh yeah. Oh cool. Do you have a, the metal case though, or the plastic case? No, the plastic. No. One. Oh, I have, I ha I have a metal case. I will give you because I was oh, just man. at scare fest. I, I was just at scare fest in in Lexington, and that's where Gun Media is, and they brought me all this stuff to hand out. I've got posters. I've got the. the I probably have fifty metal cases. I'm happy to ship send you one. No problem. Oh, that really would cool. be fantastic! Wow. Yeah. Yeah, when we get off the air, I'll, I'll we'll get your address or you can send it over yeah, to uh, my email. That'd be yeah, awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll send you, send you a poster, too. They have Sweet. two different posters. One, yeah, it's really cool. It's really great stuff. All the, I mean, I met probably 10 people from Gun Media at that uh, convention because, I mean, they're right there. They gave stuff to CJ. I mean, to uh, Kane. He was there at, uh, at the event as well. Right. So, yeah. That's a that's another great segue. You're really good at this. <laughs> um, gun media. We actually had Randy Greenback from Gun Media on a while ago, and you know, what was it like working with them? Because everybody that has been that I've spoken to on that staff, like they rave about this project and going around promoting it, working on it, all that. So, what was that experience like? Well, I think you know what I I think they brought 
Tommy Jarvis's character uh, after the fact. I think all the fans they were were requesting that mm -hmm. my character be brought, so they contacted me after the fact. After Kane had already gone in the suit, so it's not really. Yeah, I didn't get in the suit with all the for the body right. movement and stuff because they had already done that mm -hmm. with Kane and, and Tom Savini came up with his design and uh, different stuff. But I did. Um, they did send me over to, I signed the contract and they sent me, I, tr I, I tried like hell to negotiate uh, my deal. I said, okay, I want, I want to get 10 cents yeah. every time someone becomes become Tommy Jarvis. <laughs> oh God. I figured, that was, I, figured, I figured that was my retirement. <laughs> right. You would have Bill Gates money right now. Hey, that's they wouldn't perfect go, boy though. They, yeah, man. They wouldn't go for it. <laughs> Not 10 cents. Ten cents, it's only ten cents. <laughs> Times a million. No, that he would have lost a lot of money on that deal. Cause I was Tommy Jar, I would have paid you at least sixty cents today. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. Between the two of us, you'd have made a killing. <laughs> so it, was, it, it wasn't a bad strategy. Wasn't a bad strategy on my part. That is genius. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I even thought of it. That was a cool idea. But um, so yeah, they sent me an image. To uh, prove for my likeness, and the first one they sent over is like, is this guy? Did this guy not even see part six? Because <laughs> he had dark hair. He had dark hair and a five o'clock shadow and a Jay Leno, Jay Leno chin. Oh God! Like, Are you kidding me? We literally had to go. I, I literally, we literally went back and forth six times. I said, the guy's got to watch the movie. I, 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 and I took him. I took stills from, sent them over with the changes. Like he finally. You know, got 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 it close. I wasn't completely happy with what we ended up doing, but it was close enough. And yeah. uh, and then I went and I did the uh, I did the voiceovers for it. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, with, you know, doing the whole voiceover. What was that experience like, and what did you enjoy the most about it? Uh, it was it was you know, as an actor, you do a role, and then you go in and you do the. Um, the looping or whatever, the voiceovers for it, he took, because of sound and the sounds from, so that's basically what it was, it was like. Um, there was some, you kind of match your lips to what your image is saying on, on a screen, and they, it's all timed out and stuff. And then there was some uh, wild line, just some that you weren't matching, that they would, could just fill in wherever they needed them to go, you know, run or... Like yeah. getting stab noise or whatever, so that was so they would cool. actually yeah. show the character and his mouth moving, and then you'd try to think what they wanted exactly. the line to be. Exactly. Wow, that's a whole other beast. Sounds like a acting. It is. It is. There's a, there's there's um there's a group out in LA called the Loop Group, and that's all they do. They're actors, and they just they do background noise, like uh, restaurants noises, people drinking and having fun and laughing. You just they're just in the background. You just kind of hear them in the background. There's, uh, there's, it's really clever how they come up with some of the the sounds. Um, it is a talent for sure. A whole different type of. It really is. It really is. Because they're using stuff to imitate things that you wouldn't think would sound like what you need to hear, like footsteps and you it's, know stuff like exactly, that. Exactly right. When a body, it's a sack of potatoes when a body drops and hits the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of makes sense, though, because if you think about a sack of potatoes, there's a bunch of them. And, like, when a body yeah. drops, I guess it wouldn't fall all at once. Right. Very clever. But, yeah, we, we're just, we definitely had to ask you about that because we are huge fans of the game. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I've, I've actually played it and it was became myself. This was early on, and then some uh, some other camper killed me, and I was so pissed off. Oh man! Did you get on the microphone and let, tell him about it? <laughs> I I didn't. That's what we no. do. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> there was like a subculture in the game that they were being campers, and they were just creating havoc, just killing other campers yeah. and stuff. Like that. And they, they stopped that ability, uh, people having that ability, to just yeah. pissing everybody off. The game has yeah, such a huge community. It really does. And, like, they're constantly updating things because, like you said, there's, you know, they can't, they, you know, they have to figure out ways to, to 
I don't know. People who play the game, they kind of figure certain things out about it. Sort of, I guess, glitches, as you would say, you know? So mm-hmm. it's it's cool to see such a, you know, the game got released, and then to this day, it's still being worked on, still being, you know, just as much of a hype as it was. But for you, I mean, that's got to be exciting. You come on yourself, and now it's like a heightened sense. Like, you can't allow yourself to go down no more. <laughs> You're playing yourself. Right, exactly. The game is is extremely competitive, that's for sure. But um, yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts r- real quick on also Never Hike Alone was a big deal. How did how did you come across joining in with that project? Well, I'll tell you, I have a very good friend of mine who's a writer. I've known her for thirty years, and uh, he had a roommate, and his roommate had a friend who they all became very close and talking and stuff like that. And he goes, I hate to bother you, but would you do me a huge favor? This guy, my roommate's friend, is a huge Friday the 13th fan, and he won't shut up now that he knows I know you. Would you mind, please do me a favor? Would you mind, you know, saying hi or, you know, having lunch? I said, said, sure, just to get him off your back, I'll I'll say hi. (laughs) So we arranged to go have dinner, and uh, it was Barry J. He was the executive producer on Never Hike Alone. And then he, during the course of dinner, he said, would you mind, would you be interested in doing, maybe doing a fan film? Because there's this, the legality things going on, the fight of the 13th. I said, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, fan film? I mean, come on. Right. right. I fucking, I fucking yeah. fan, fan film, really? I said, sure. I, send me the script. Because I can do better than that. I can send you the script, and we've already shot half of it. I said, great. <laughs> so having no intention of being in part of it in any way. <laughs> the fan film. Yeah. I've seen fan right. I've seen fan films. Yeah. They're not very good. <laughs> they so very rarely were. He sent me they sent it over to me and the first half and uh it was amazing. Mm. It was the production value was there, the drone shots. The guy leading uh, Drew acting, it was topical. He had a GoPro. He was like looking for, he, he, he rates trails and he comes across a trail and it was like, cool. It was great. I said, great. Yeah, I'd like to be a part of it. I think, I think it would be fun. And uh, so I, then Vincent and I got set together and we, we kind of worked out uh, what we wanted to do. I, I wanted something a little bit different, but we settled on me being the paramedic, and um, yeah, I had a great time. It was on a one day shoot, and I brought my son up there with me, who was playing the game. He had never seen me act. Yeah, he had, he had never. My wife went up, and my daughter, and my son, and he was watching the camera, you know, the monitor and stuff, and watching me do my scenes. And he comes over, he goes, "Hey, Dad, you're pretty good." <laughs> right. <laughs> you're pretty. You're pretty. You're pretty good at this. You really did do this stuff, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. It was fun for him. Fun for me. And uh, we, you know, we 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 showed it to the Vincent showed it to the uh, reviewers, and they were kind enough to keep my name out of it because when we um, premiered it at the Telluride Horror Film Festival. Uh, a year ago in October, uh, they snuck. I snuck into the back door and stuff like that, and to watch the audience and stuff like that. And when Ooh. I showed up on camera, they just bolted out of their seats. It was just so so much fun. Bless. And the review. I like the fact that they kept Tommy in there too. Like when you showed up, they said, you know, they mentioned Tommy. That was awesome. In the oh, fan film, that's a paramedic. Yeah. Yeah. Like when yes. you popped up, they yeah. said Tommy in the film. Right. It was on my uh, paramedic uh, costume too. Had my name yeah. on it. It's, it's little stuff like that that makes us freak out as fans. Little stuff like yeah. that. That's <laughs> huge. Because yeah, we know who you are. We know Tommy. But when they mention it and then you have your name on there like that, like that means a lot. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about doing a sequel. A, actually, a prequel and then a sequel. And the sequel, uh, we're going to do Never Hike in the Snow and then Never Hike Again. And Never Hike Again actually will take place uh, Vincent wrote a great script. It will take place before Never Hike Alone. Oh wow! During Never Hike Alone, 
and after Never Hike Alone. So in Never Hike Alone, you saw or you heard my fight with Jason. In Never Hike Again, in Never Hike Again, you will actually see the fight with Jason. So it's oh, just no. like wow. it's like passes through Never Hike Alone before, during, and after. It's more from my perspective, me watching him hike because I'm there, and I'm, and then uh, we're bringing back uh, Vinny Gustafaro, who is uh, the deputy, who's going to be now the sheriff in Wester County. Uh, he's coming back. And then we, 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 you see us tear ass out of there in the paramedic uh, truck, and we go to the hospital, and the sheriff now, Vinny Gustafaro is now the sheriff. He shows up with two two deputies, and we have an altercation. We've got to get this guy fixed, and blah, blah. And then... Um, all hell breaks loose. Jason shows up, and that's awesome. But, uh, so shout out to them too because they did a really good job in uh, personating no, you know, Jason Voorhees. And I think that's why that's part of why it gets the praise that it does. Because I mean, how many Friday Thirteenth fan films are there? Well, now there's like five or six. I mean, Vengeance just came out, right? And uh, his name was Jason. Jason Rising. Yeah, Jason Rising, and I'm actually in Vengeance, but I'm not. They just you. It's it's my kid. It's my picture at the end. Or CJ's burning it up. Okay, I heard. Um, but it's my, apparently my children. Uh, so yeah, it's all good. So, is there anybody in your family that's looking to become an aspiring actor or following you your footsteps? You know, I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get my son, who uh, <clears throat> who is kind of, uh, I'm trying to get him a part. I'm doing a a couple of movies, one in November and then one uh, next year. So, I'm trying to get him to play uh, a younger character in it, and they seem to be open to it. And I think it'd be fun for him. I honestly, I don't like unless it's commercials or stuff. I do not like children. To become actors, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Because if they if they're unsuccessful, it messes with their head. If they're successful, it messes with their head. Great point. I I haven't seen. There's been a few uh, young actors who child stars who were able to make the transition into uh, adult acting. So right. I always tell people if they want to do it, have them wait until they're. You know, in their 20, 18, 20s or whatever, and then do it that way. Because I've, I've known a lot of people, as children actors, who just, it doesn't, it doesn't build well in the long run for them. It's hard for them to function in life. Isn't that crazy? Because, like, I guess, like, like, I mean, I can understand what you're saying, you know, because if I put my six-year-old in there, and I guess kind of like either or, because there's such a, a preconceived notion about it, you know, like where you're supposed to be in Hollywood and whatnot, and it can kind of affect right. their minds way. And if and if they don't get, you know, you, it messes with you even as an adult if you keep auditioning and you don't get it and you can't figure out why. Mm. And then especially, I mean, in my experience, I did some shitty auditions and I I would get the fucking part, and then I would do some great auditions. I felt. And right. I wouldn't get the part. And it just, like, it totally mind... It mind fucks you. I see where you were going. <laughs> it just messes with your mind. You can't figure out what the... What the you know, you imagine can't. being a kid and trying to figure that out. You, you, exactly. I mean, and, and if you do great and they, you get great reviews, it's going to mess up your head. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to try and create that again and, and want that and be adored and stuff like that. It's just tough. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I don't do it. I don't have any of my kids do it. So, but uh, he's older now. So he's a, he's uh, going to be sixteen. Give him a little taste and see if he wants to do it. He's a very good looking kid. He can do modeling or whatever yeah. if you want. I think we all would be excited to see you know see him get in there and of course yeah. you return <laughs> well. But I, I, earlier you mentioned that you something about a construction company. Do you st do you have anything like that going on or? Yeah, I, I like I said earlier, I've always had construction in my family. So my dad was involved in it. My grandfather worked for the studio, so we always had these tools around the house in the garage and stuff like drill presses and saws and chop saws and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, we'd always go down there as, as kids and make our secret boxes and stuff, you know, to keep our private stuff in it. 
we weren't smoking weed then, but we would <laughs> stick other stuff in there. And uh, <laughs> uh, later on, we would, I guess, in high school. Uh, so that was always around. And I took woodshop and woodshop and in, in 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 high school and came up with some cool stuff. So I was always very creative and just always around. And uh, in between acting jobs. And after I got uh, done with Lorimar, um, I, I just hate sitting around, so I, that's how I kept busy. Uh, mm. uh, doing finished carpentry work for my landlord or my friends or whatever, whoever. Um, and so uh, eventually, just uh, honestly, it just kind of took off. Uh, started a company. I kind of got into acting because of my, I had three children, and also uh, I was losing money. Having to, having to go on auditions. Right. Um, no kidding. It just, it just didn't make sense financially to go uh, to go on auditions anymore. And I, I, I hate audition. I hate auditioning anyway. <laughs> I never liked it. I was never. I, I'm a slow study, you know. So um, it takes me a while to kind of think about it and, and 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 get the character and get the feel of the character and stuff. I like to study it and, and dissect it and stuff. Um, so, uh, I never really enjoyed auditioning. And then, um, you know, my construction company just kind of took off. So I just kind of went that way and my kids were here and didn't want to re- be out of town. I just kind of wanted to experience them growing up and stuff like that. Yeah. Like town. Makes sense. But Mr. Matthews, I wanted to have one question that I wanted to kind of wrap up with. Yeah, obviously the lawsuit and everything that's going on with Friday the 13th. I was just wondering what what would your picture perfect ending for that be? Like a, a, another movie? Like is is there any way you imagine it? The picture picture perfect ending with those guys would settle on a, on, on a number and they would get both of them would get something. Right. You know, 10% or 5% or whatever the number is. Mm-hmm. I don't know. If the pro- proceeds from from the movie. Fine. And then I would love to see uh, Tom McLaughlin do the final 13th movie in the franchise and have me come back in it. But that's not going to happen, as I understand it. Uh, he's already written a script. Um, and it's basically, there's no guys in it. There's no Tommy Jarvis in it at all. Wow. Uh, so, so there goes my dream. And he also, he also, he also I heard him on interviews saying that he thought that Tommy Jarvis is getting <clears throat> too um, watered down from, from all the fan films that I've done. And I, oh my I, God. I called him out on it and I said, no. I said, Tom, I have done one fan film. One, period. To this date, I've done one fan film. He goes, oh, sorry. I thought because, you know, in Vengeance, they kept bringing up your name. Oh, he, and he has a cameo in Vengeance in the beginning of it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So he was around. And he, he also consulted on it. You know that that's such crap. You know what? I agree with you. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> fan films. No one. I mean, the fans see him. It's not a massive thing like a studio would put out. You know. I mean, look. Never hike. Ne- ne- never hike alone's got a, almost a million views. You know, and if you what if you multiply that by ten bucks, well, that'd be twenty million dollars. So that is a movie, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but it Never does mind. so much. For, it, it does so much for the genre. I I agree. Well, I think you know what I think. I think they missed the boat. They should have carried in part seven, eight, and nine that the antagonist and uh, protagonist in, in in Tommy Jarvis and, and Jason. They should have continued that. You know, they should have continued that thread. The fans really responded to that. They had somebody to root for finally in, in Tommy Jarvis. You know, so that was yeah, that dude. Was you're right. Mistake. Yeah. yeah. What they ended up doing is uh, whatever was popular that year, whatever made the most money that year, whatever theme it was. Space. Uh, <laughs> in, in space <laughs> or kinetic dynasty or whatever, that's what they ended up form- formulating the scripts after, which didn't really you know, help the franchise. It's like, I, you know, I can't wait to see the Rambo movie. I mean, I was a huge Rambo fan. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. <laughs> You and me both, um, man. I I love because, Stallone. I love only, Rambo. Only because it, there's there's a there's a, you know, with all the Friday the Thirteenth except for Part Five, there's the through line is Jason. He's through, yeah. you know, you see him in every one of them, and he does one thing. Um. Uh. So that's because, and I think they they should have done it. 
after they developed the character of Tommy Jarvis, they could have carried that forever. You know, like The Fugitive or... Yeah. It just could have went, went on forever. Kind of like the Lori Strode for Friday the 13th, Tommy yeah. Jarvis. Yeah, exactly. I, I just can't wrap my so. head around that because it's like fans obviously want it. You know, so it's like you're deterring from what the fans want to look at a stack of numbers for whatever, you know, statistics up that year. And it's like, okay, well, but the fans want this. This is what they're reacting to. There are people in the game who will kill themselves just so they could come back as Tommy. <laughs> there are, yeah. <laughs> there are. Cha-ching, here's my 10 cents. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah, um, my last question would be, if you have any advice for aspiring actors and with your experience, if there's anything you could tell them, you know, any advice that you can, you can mention, what would it be? I would tell them to be very quiet and observe everything, and go to class, go to a good class, and study the scenes, and live very modestly, because you're not going to make a lot of money. Um, have a job. Take, you got to take care of business first. You have to eat. You have to wash your clothes. If you're in a town where you need a car, you have to get around town to go to auditions and stuff like that. But be, be quiet and just observe and, and do your work and be passionate and work will be get work so if you're just constantly doing it and um or really want to do it and just sustain yourself i know a lot of actors are very 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 talented i've seen them in acting classes they're not working uh they would crumble under the audition you know going to auditions and stuff they just didn't know how to handle it but the talent was there so the, and you got to be lucky. You got to be kind of in the right place, and you got to go up on, got to go up for the stuff. The invi- the, the, the environment's a little bit different now, uh, because you can actually put yourself on videotape. Before you have, you'd have to go to audition with your picture and your resume stapled to the back, but hand that in. Now it's completely different. You can actually. I did a western last year. It's actually uh, the world premiere is going to be in Detroit on Thursday, where this guy is one of the. You know, he's one of the has one of the medium parts in it, and he got it by putting himself on videotape. His name is Matt Fling, and he's, he did a great job. And we're we're, we're friends now, and and uh, that's how we got the role. Wow. Um. So, yeah, it was uh, it's interesting. It's different now. So you can and just keep putting it up there. It's like my my wife says, we got to win the lottery. I said, honey. We're not going to win if we don't play. That's true. Hey, that's that's <laughs> definitely true. You know, you got to put your hat so, in there to, to be able to be um, exactly. That's what I would advise. Great advice and great conversation, Mr. Matthews. We thank you so much for hopping on and take spending your night with us. Uh, my Bobby, my pleasure. If you, there's anything you want to promote. Uh, let them know where to contact you. Anything? Oh well, I'm gonna. I've got. Uh, let's see. I've got. Um, well, I mentioned Warpath, which is going to be coming out. It's a western we did. It takes place in the 1890s. I play a really fun. We shot in Detroit, believe it or not. It wasn't in Texas or Montana or someplace. Oh. Uh, but per- panoramic pictures. Um, I'm curious to see how it turned out. Uh, it's gonna. If anyone's in Detroit. On Thursday, come on by, um, and then I did uh, I did a movie called Cure Therapy, which we're having a screen on October 16th in Los Angeles. That's more in the horror genre, which is a lot of fun, really gruesome and disturbing, and <laughs> perfect for the horror fan. Um, and then I'll be uh, I'll be in Canada at the Hamilton Con on October 18th to 20th. And uh, down at Spooky Empire uh, in Tampa, Florida, on October 31st through through the 3rd. So if anybody's down there, come on by and say hi. Love to see everybody. That's awesome. I might I might see you in Tampa now because I live in Jacksonville, so that ain't too far of a stretch. That would be great. Love to see you. Uh oh, they they can spot. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Have a great night and thank My you. My pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Bobby. I'll talk to you soon. Not a problem, sir. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
All right. I hope you guys enjoyed me. You're gushing over this. I am. I'm really excited. I hope everybody enjoys it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't think they can't. Uh, Bob Matthews, you said it. And I don't want anybody who's listening who is who is familiar with the show knows this is a very good thing. But we don't mean this is a good thing. He's a salami boy. He's a salami boy big time. He's one of us. Yes. He's a salami boy. We just chopped it up with him like it was just another regular episode, man. Yeah, that was awesome, dude. That was really, 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 really good. I like him. You lot. said he's a salami boy. <laughs> he's a salami boy straight up. Like he's a he's a homegrown LA native, man. He keeps it real. Like and then like I seen that in his biography. I said, This is this is a salami boy. I said, There's <laughs> no way this ain't no salami boy. Like born and raised Hollywood, you know, no, not Hollywood, but California. Yeah. Right. Salon. Back in that time. Yeah, for sure. You know, I just had that vibe from him all, of, you know, just watching his movies and shit. He's just he always came off that way. And he's awesome. That is awesome. That was like one of the best interviews ever. I think the main thing is like a lot of them, you know, they, they want to be themselves and you know he just kind of cut loose with us and that was that was great he had some legitimate like this is a real dude like i know like you know he's an actor and all that but at the end of the day he cares about his family he cares about what's coming into his household if he gets a gig great but you know what that doesn't mean shit to him is is in the lot like he told you in in the in the advice at the end, like save your money. You still gotta wash your clothes. You got that's as real as it could get. You know, he runs a construction company. He learned a trade. He learned how to put food on the table, and that's what it's about. You know, if I get the gig, great. But what am I gonna do if I don't? He, he's real as fuck. I really appreciated everything that he he said on this episode. It was amazing having him on here. It really was. He's a salami boy. <laughs> dude, if there's one fucking dude out of all the interviews we ever did that I felt like I could go out and sit down and have a drink and like it would be him. Hell yeah. 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 Tom Matthews. That's a real one. And then the whole punk rock scene they was talking about like the dead Kennedys and shit in that era. Yeah. Phenomenal, dude. Like he was in the mix of all that. Like what he has and the knowledge and the experience that he dude, nobody knows about that. No they they won't not in this time and era. You know, that shit is long. I it's wish I wish I was fucking around in L.A. back at that time in his age and stuff like that's where I feel like I should have been born at. Like, right. Amazing. Because I was I could feel the passion. in you. Oh, dude, that was phenomenal. I felt something. Man. It was spiritual. I felt like a connection. Is he your new Rob Zombie? As far as an actor? Yeah. Yeah, so that that was awesome, man. He opened up about a lot of stuff, and just real conversation. Yeah, he opened up. He 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 really um gave a lot of insight on how it was coming up for himself as an actor and the reality of being an actor and what's going on. And you know, a lot of us normal people, I guess you would say, like there's we would assume there's glitz and glamour, but it ain't always sunshine and rainbows. Oh. And he wasn't afraid to, to go ahead and give you that side of the story as well. And you'll see in the interview, or as you have heard in the interview. Yeah, that was that that was awesome. That was awesome. This was make this was a great way to celebrate our 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 anniversary because I mean we had a, a salami boy on, someone one of us, real guy. It was perfect. I fucking dude, I turned down a blowjob for this. <laughs> wow. Okay. I would. <laughs> I would. Wow. I would. Okay. All right. I mean, I love Tom and all, but I don't know if I'm doing that. Turn down. Turn down. Clear it next week. You know what, though? I wonder if he would. I hope he would. Because, you know what? He just. He's so real with it? Yeah, he's so real with it. I hope he would, you know? <laughs> you know I wouldn't well, would want him to. I don't think he'd want to either. But, nah. uh. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you guys for checking out our anniversary episode. Thank you guys for supporting us for these two years. It's been awesome. And uh, this is, uh, for anybody who's familiar, you already know. But for any new listeners, you know, this, is, this is what you get. This is what you get, so buckle up. Yeah, it's going to be a long one. You don't know what's next. We're still waiting on an email from Rob about his <laughs> and all that, so we'll let you guys know. <laughs> Stay tuned. 
It'll be posted on the website. Oh, it's going to be posted. <laughs> but you know what the sad part is? Rob, Rob will probably put us to shame. Even if it's small. <laughs> Even? <laughs> I don't know how that works. Even if it's small, I don't know. That's how it works with him. It's true. Even when it's small, he makes it so big in, in different ways. But, uh, yeah, guys, thanks for checking us out. So we're going to have our regularly, this isn't replacing our weekly episode, because we grinds like that. So later in the week, you can fully expect our regular weekly episode. We'll be back this week, and we'll be back next week, and the week after that, and all, so on and so forth. Uh, you can keep up with all that by subscribing on iTunes, on Google Play, on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, all that shit, wherever you get your podcast from. Except Spotify. Fuck Spotify. Spotify. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Really? Yeah. They, they, they want us to change our RSS feed. And, uh, we ain't doing that. Why do they want all that then? I don't know. Uh, but you know what? Fuck Spotify. <laughs> so, anyway, go, 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 subscri- uh, go subscribe to us so that you don't miss anything every week. And go to SlasherRadio.com. You can also catch all our shit there. The best way to contact us is on Twitter, at SlasherRadio. Or you can hit me up at Mikey's Dead. Mink, where can they hit you up? You can hit me up oh, at shit. Bobby Spitzer oh. with two R's. And I'm telling you, when you log on to my profile and you see that face, I'm going to bring you all the biggest and baddest that there is. Hugest <laughs> on Twitter. Oh. The biggest oh. on Twitter. Oh. Low hanging Balls swinging left, right in your <laughs> mama's face in the kitchen. Ooh, I'm gonna be cooking them pancakes, boy. But naked, cheeks flapping, Bobby cheeks. Don't forget, see you on the playground. Damn! Wow! I can't How's follow that. that. I, I can't follow. <laughs> it's, it's not the episode's over. I don't know what the fuck else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was trying to get inspiration from the from wrestling. Mate. Yeah, I, I can tell you were very yeah. I felt it. Very good. Dude, there's nobody who promotes better than wrestlers, right? That's right. Wrestlers and Bobby Spitzer. So <laughs> on that note, check us out next week, guys. Good night, folks. Watch her again. I don't know, man. I just had I just felt like, you know, fucking letting letting the letting it raw smack down on the JDS. Wow. All the best of Slasher Radio Podcast. Uncle Stevie doesn't like being, you know, he likes to just, he will, he will do something just because. He'll do it his way. Yeah. Yeah, his way. Stevie, don't pick that up like that. It's bad for your back. You got tilted. (laughs) No, it ain't. (laughs) Three weeks later, you're calling, you want to go see, no, my fucking, my back hurts. (laughs) Uh, I see. That's because you moved that shell you shouldn't have done. It It has nothing to do with that work. (laughs) <laughs> and it fucking started hurting. <laughs> it's something completely unrelated. <sighs> um. By the way, speaking of L.A., mm-hmm. the Rams are playing right now. Mick, I don't know if you have anybody on there, but I know Baker Mayfield is your boy. Mink, fuck football right now. What happened? Fuck. Did you lose? Dude, yeah, I'm 0-3 it- in my other league. Are you fucking serious? Dude, first week, week one, the injury gods hate me. Week one, Tyreek Hill gets hurt. That's my number one receiver. My best guy, best receiver. Out for six weeks, maybe more. Tevin Coleman gets hurt. He's one of my running backs. He was like a a backup, but he got a lot. He was really good fantasy. Tevin Coleman injured, out for fucking who knows when. He's going to be out for a long time. Well, the shot Jackson got injured too, so I mean, I can understand. But now I'm getting a week two. Yeah. Now, now look at week two. Alshon Jeffrey gets hurt. That's my second oh, best yeah, receiver. Yeah, dude, he fucked. I don't know what happened that Monday night, but the Eagles were fucking. Yeah. 
Same night as Deshaun Jackson. So now Deshaun Jackson was on my waiver wire. I was going to pick him up. He's hurt. So there, there goes an Alshon Jeffrey. My, now my first and second best receivers are down. My shit. Alabama, man. So now Najoku gets hurt, my tight end. He's out for the game. Now God. I'm like, fuck. Michael Gallup gets hurt. He's out for the game. I'm like, you got two receivers and one tight end out in one week. I, I lost. I got demolished. Uh, like those were zero. Like they had like three points by the time they, they got hurt early. So now we stroll on to this week. Keep in mind, my two best wide receivers are down. My third, one of my strong running backs, one of my strong receivers, and my tight end, my sole tight end, all gone. I think I traded, I sent away John Ross and Jason Witten, Juicy Dick. And I took oh, no, advantage. Yes, I did. Because I said, I need somebody. Witten's not every week. But they're playing Miami. I could use that value. John Ross is the number one receiver in fantasy in yards in the NFL. I'm like, that's not going to keep happening. I could use that while he's hot. I got Mark Andrews. Dude got eight targets and nine targets in week one and two. Traded for I got him. I'm like, all right. But now dude had to drop somebody to accept the trade. He dropped T.Y. Hilton. Scooped him up. Mink, this week, T.Y. Hilton got hurt, knocked out at the beginning of the third quarter. And Saquon Barkley. Oh, yeah, that was a fucking major Mink. blow. Mink. Major I'm blow. sitting there like, all right, Mink, I'm playing Miguel. I'm talking because I was I was running a train on him. I was talking shit all day. Mm-hmm. All that that uh, emoji thing I sent you, the an emoji, whatever, I did. There's like a horse one. And yeah. whenever one of my players scored, I went on there and went, touchdown, T.Y. Hilton. Shit like that because <laughs> it looked country. Dude, right. every, t- every score. I was going ham on him. <laughs> T.Y. Hilton goes down. I'm like, fuck. All right, you know what? So I got Saquon. I got this dude I picked up who did really good last week. He's got a great matchup. He's hot. Everybody, all the, the fantasy shit saying he's a must start this week. He fumbles the first two times he touches the ball. He does nothing. Saquon Barkley hurts. So now I'm sitting there like, all right, he better come back in this fucking game. The next time I see Saquon Barkley, he's got crutches and a fucking walking boot on. Yeah, he wasn't coming back, man. No. Mink, I'm in shambles. I'm in shambles. Still got Tom Brady. Not in this league. Oh. <laughs> I had to pick up Jacoby Brissett. I don't even know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew Luck's back up. Mink, I'm in sh- And now Miguel's talking all kind. Of, I had to put my phone on silent. I, dude, I was, I was a cranky little cunt today. Well, you got something to be happy about, man. Everything made right with Tom Matthews. <laughs> that's just, that's what I mean. This was the only good thing about today. Like today was miserable. So I I, I got pissed off at around three three thirty. I was only up since one. Shit. So I, was, I got like two and a half hours, three hours of happiness in. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> it was all it was worth. 